Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ask a VC Anything. And we'll wait for you to get settled and join us. And then we'll get started here. So hope everyone is doing well. Thursday late afternoon here in Silicon Valley and early morning your time if you're in Asia and in the middle of the night if you're in Europe I think or maybe almost morning uh, but anyhow thank you all for joining us and uh, I do see people joining in now thank you all you participants out there so today we're going to be going for about an hour and then we'll go with our networking session afterwards. Uh, so we're for about a half hour. So hopefully you'll all enjoy and we'll all get to learn a lot from our VC victim today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Thank Sean. you for having me, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. So uh, let me get, um, uh, let it let us get started here. And so today, 5.30 p.m., ask if you see anything. And I know we do have some loyalists here among us today. So thank you for rejoining us. And so you already know about all of our products, but there they are, our mobile app, videos, our new series, and so forth. And today, I found this wonderful picture of you, Sean. Yeah, I think that was the Irish Times or something like that uh, when I lived in Ireland. That, <laughs> uh, I was on a TV show called Dragon's Den. In oh, Ireland. yeah. No, I, I love this photo. So I think that this is a really wonderful, welcoming photo for today's session. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay. Yeah, no, we're so happy to have you here. Um, and Sean, I dug up another photo of you. <laughs> that's, from, <laughs> that's from my friend Andy Dressel, who actually updated the Wikipedia page for, for me with the, that photo from college. So yeah. uh, dra dragging it uh, all the way uh, back, went to RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He was a roommate yeah. of mine, actually. Yeah, that, yeah, that's great. You really haven't changed very much. Well, that, that hair is more like what my hair looks like now than the, the, than the last picture. It's, uh, the coronavirus has uh, left me without a haircut for the last couple of months. So it's a little yeah. bushy, a little wild. Yeah, a little wild. <laughs> yeah, my, my hair is getting really long. But uh, maybe on Monday I can get it cut where the salons will finally be open. All right. Well, look, um, our star is here with us tonight. And let's, uh, let's learn about Sean. So I dug up some interesting facts about Sean. Also, I spent some time interviewing him before this episode. I found out that he grew up in upstate New York and yeah. um, in, in farmland, right? Yeah, I worked on farms growing up. I worked as, uh, you know, picking weeds out of carrot farms and baling hay out of, uh, you know, cow, cow farms and, and yeah. um, regular, regular uh, th those kinds of uh that kind of life uh, for for a bit before I found my way into programming computers when I was around fourteen. So my first oh, first few jobs, first few jobs were you know just uh, on the farms when you, you you I don't know that it's legal when you're like seven and nine, but I was working from around that age because uh, I grew up in a really uh, disadvantaged uh, background. My my mom had nine kids with my biological father who. Uh, turned out to be a deadbeat dad when I was three and, and left the family and didn't pay any child support. So we, we grew up on the welfare uh, system. And so I grew up in upstate New York and, and that was uh, for six years, we were on the welfare until my mom had enough of us uh, that were sort of going off to uh, college uh, that she could work full time. And, um, and uh, yeah, so that was how I got started. And then I, I, did some programming and uh, learned how to do that and, and got a job programming computers for, for the government when I was 14 in upstate New York. Wow, you must have been a real whiz at computers. And then you I, got into Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which I understand is a really tough school. Yeah, it's a great school. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, notable people that came out of RPI. Uh, the, uh, 
inventor of the television, the father of television, the father of um, the microprocessor, Marcia mm -hmm. Hoff, the, the, the guy who designed the Brooklyn Bridge and or built the Brooklyn Bridge and Ferris wheel, you know, the, all those different uh, types of uh, modern, uh, you know, some modern day inventions and some far old inventions. But uh, well, so that yeah. must have been a great environment for you to be in then. Yeah, it was great. It was a, is a, you know, it was an, it's an engineering school. And so, um, you know, that was, and it's really a tough uh, school, you know, uh, like yeah. really hardcore. They, yeah. Uh, they they really push you to the limit, and it was it was uh, hard for 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 my background. Uh, I really had to stretch quite a bit. Yeah, I, I've heard it's tough. So uh, from there, it actually gave you your entree to form or co-found Map Info, which was a huge success. Yeah. So I did start. I in order to pay for university, I, I was uh, working uh, for IBM and um, other places while I was still going to university, co doing co-op programs. And, uh, and that gave me a, an exposure to some of the new technologies that were coming out, like the CD-ROM and, you know, mm -hmm. the, believe it or not, the 286 computer. This was back, you know, that long ago, uh, or the 386 maybe it was. I think it was the 286. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that was, you know, a PC, um, and it was, uh, enough power that we could actually bring street maps to personal computers for the first time. And that's what we did. We were the world leader at, at, uh, creating street maps on all computers, uh, really, but, uh, PCs, the first on PCs as well. So is that the kind of software that works on Google maps today? Well, uh, Google Maps is a is a different uh, source code. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, there's thousands of other uh, companies that base their products and incorporated our mm -hmm. software into their products, Microsoft and and uh, and Oracle and 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 actually just hundreds, well, thousands of actual other companies that bundled our APIs or our programming language and built mm -hmm. applications around our our, our uh, capabilities. So. Okay. Uh, it's behind a lot of uh, technologies that are out there, um, or more so in the past uh, than, than today. But it's still a couple hundred million dollar company, uh, MapInfo. Right. And uh, even the maps that were in China were originally digitized by uh, MapInfo uh, staff. Uh, so if you look at the street maps in China, they were created by people that spun out of MapInfo to create the first mapping oh. company in, in China. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and then MapInfo with your basically your classmates, right? You created this map info and then it was sold. It was sold uh, like four years after you created it? Or something no, like it, was, uh, it was more like seven. It went public seven actually, what wasn't uh -huh. sold. It, it was sold, it, was, it went public and then I think it was another 10 years or so before it was acquired by another, you know, like a Fortune 500 company. Um, right. So, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, quite a run. And yeah, it was, uh, that was what gave me, a, a, you know the the thirst and the drive to keep doing it again sure. and i thought when i did the first one i thought geez that was easy i mean it wasn't easy it was super hard but it was uh i thought geez i did it once i can do it again and the second time i i, I found it was much harder uh to duplicate a success some of it is about being in the right place at the right time with the right product right and uh other pieces of it are about uh you know uh you know, just having the right team, uh, obviously, and and pulling a great team together is the most difficult, uh, one of the most difficult things. Right. So the second one was net centric. I, I have listed here. Yes, that's the that's the second uh, technology company I started. Yep. Right. So and, what the uh, timing was just not good for that because you hit up against the dot com boom or the bust. I did. I hit. I did, I hit against the dot-com boom. Actually, I don't know that it was 94. It was probably 95 or something that we started in that centric. It was just as- December 94? I, maybe, I don't know when it was actually. Maybe it is 94. Uh, okay. But uh, I was with that until around 2000 uh, or 98. Yeah, 98. Mm -hmm. So we coined the term uh, cloud computing at NetCentric. Uh -huh. Uh, and that was that, that was the big uh, right. uh, thing that I've left from that. But it was otherwise not a not a notable experience uh, 
other than the scars that it left on my soul because it, it was, uh, we built it to around 10 million in revenue, which is not bad for a startup, but it was uh, around 8 million in, uh, uh, wait, wait, 10 million in expenses and 8 million in revenue. And you see, that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't sound that bad for the way that startups normally go because you normally do do that. But when you hit the dot bomb uh, sort of, uh, you know, era and there's no funding available, it really impressed on me how you, you need to keep, uh, you need to keep in, under control of your own destiny uh, by, you know, always being able to, as you build a company, to be able to switch over to profitable uh, as, as soon as you can. Right. Well, one of the reasons I'm keeping this slide up here is because you've had so many career turns. Your, your career is so diverse. You've done cinematography, you've been an inventor, an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, yeah. uh, an engineer, a programmer. Uh, I mean, uh, you have kind of a, a creative bent. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in a lot of things. I think that's, you know, a curious mind is one of the things that makes for um, great entrepreneurs, a great entrepreneur normally, you know, um, and, you know, entrepreneurs can, you know, normally it takes a whole bunch of expertise to be able to offer value to a new, to an industry. I've, I've always come in sort of an outsider to the industry <laughs> and uh, had that fresh perspective. Uh, you know, I didn't, no, when I was doing mapping, street mapping on computers, that it it had never been done. Uh, you know, it had been done like by cartographers, but that was like completely irrelevant to what people like. When you type an address into a computer and you see a street map, that's what you want to do. You know, you want to go to a place or you want to overlay data on top of it and things like that. That's where I came from, um, and so my perspective was always very different from the people that had been working in the industry for a decade or. or or whatever. So I think that fresh perspective sometimes works. And often the startups that we find are the most valuable though, are people that have been working at the same problem for 10 years and they're just so frustrated uh, with the status quo and they, but they have such a deep expertise that they know how to bring that change to the market. And those are the ones that, that probably normally are the ones that are more reliable to, to back and to have take off. Right. Right. So, well, you founded SOSV in 94, according to your LinkedIn profile. And um, yeah. And uh, what, what prompted you to do that? Well, I had, you know, the company, my first company went public. And um, so I was just investing in other startups, other people that I knew um, as sort of an angel or mm -hmm. really probably more of a super angel because angels typically write 10 to 25, maybe $50,000 checks. I was sort of writing up to a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, checks. And so I was backing uh, companies uh, as a sort of super angel. For, and that's how it started as, as, as SOSV actually originally started just as me and a checkbook. Uh, and for the first 10 years, that that's all it was. Right. But at a certain point, it just became, um, there was, there were enough IPOs, there were enough, you know, money under management that it suddenly said, geez, I can't handle this uh, just by myself anymore. And so was able to draw together some like-minded uh, other uh, people who had previously run um, organizations and built, built startups and had a lot of experience in doing that so that they could help uh, fund other startups with me. Right. So now you're onto your fourth fund. Yeah. Uh, well, it's actually only the, the first, uh, the first fund was really just a, a, um, more of a recycled sort of family office almost. It was just a, um, uh, and so that was the first, uh, more than 10 years. Um, uh, like more like 15 years. Um, and then, uh, and that grew, very well, um, to hundreds in, uh, of millions under management. And then I uh, then said, uh, I would, you know, the government of Ireland came, approached us and said, hey, would you manage some money for us? You know, would you invest in startups for us? And we said, yes, we, we would look at doing that. And at that point, we, that was SOSB2, it was just for Ireland. It was a very small fund. And then we said, okay, well, we could do that for, 
if we're doing it for Ireland, we might as well do it for others. And then SOSB3 came along and that, that was $150 million fund. And the most current fund is closer to $300 million, uh, $277 million. Um, so we, you know, manage around seven hundred million in capital uh, right now, and there's one hundred and twenty of us doing that. One hundred and twenty on staff. Yeah, now. yeah, more than that With, actually. Oh, more than that, and seven accelerators. I think you almost lost track of how many it was, but I think it's seven, right? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, uh, eight locations. So you have, you have uh, Shenzhen and then a Taipei and New York and Silicon Valley and uh, where else? Uh, we've got, we've got, uh, yeah, we, well, in terms of the accelerators, uh, Tokyo, uh, Xi'an, um, and uh, sh you mentioned Shanghai and Shenzhen and Taipei, right? So then uh, New York, and um, what am I missing? Well, uh, Ireland, we had also, we actually have multiple accelerators in New York is the, is the thing. Okay. We, had, we had our, our um, Rebel Bio, which we've rebranded and brought to New York. So we're, we have basically two to three accelerators in New York. We've got uh, Foodex um, and D-Lab and um, Indie Bio New York now is, so, so it's maybe it's only seven locations now. I think. Okay, so Indie for Indie Bio for Life Sciences, and then the one that starts with a D is blockchain and fintech, and yeah, the food one is anything new with food food tech. Yeah, you know, uh, basically better for you food options for healthier food options for people, but also future of food applications. Oh, um, I see. Yeah, like, 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 what's an example of a portfolio company? In the well, you know, plant-based protein uh, foods, or we also do a lot in in indie bio of uh, future food, which is like the Memphis meats of the world, uh, where you make meats w without animals. You know, without you don't yeah. a world without slaughter, where you can eat meat without without animals, and then yeah. we also have, um, uh, you know a number of other making milk without cows and making, um, you know, gelatin without, you know, um, bones of, of, you know, all, all different types of, uh, uh, you know, egg whites without chickens, all, all sorts of different sort of uh, future food uh, categories. So those, those have taken off massively. Uh, and so those we've backed basically about half of the cellular agriculture uh, companies have come out of SOSV's accelerators. Um, either out of our indie bio accelerator originally in London and 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 Cork to um, um, San Francisco. Okay, so I, I first um, discovered SOSV through China Accelerator because I was covering China and <clears throat> Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong regularly, and I met your team in. Well, actually, I met William Balbean. He was my first contact with SOSV. And uh, William and China Accelerator, actually, we've done some events together in Shanghai and Beijing. It's been, you know, it's been great to have the support. Um, but I was just curious, how did you meet Bill? Uh, how did you meet William? William Balbean. So we had, so most of the people that ended up being SOSV general partners uh, were originally mentors at one of our programs. Okay. And William Malbean had been a mentor at China, the China Accelerator before. I always think of China Accelerator as William Baobin's baby because it really is. But before William Baobin ran it, it was China, um, set up by Cyril Ebersweiler. Do you know Cyril? Yes, yeah, so I know yeah, him too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's so, in San Francisco now, right? Yeah, he's in San Francisco, yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, he also set up our Hacks Accelerator. And so when he went to go set up Hacks in Shenzhen, the world's leading hardware accelerator, yeah. um, he, uh, he um, uh, you know, left a hole in, in Shanghai that we needed to, to, to fill. And so we looked to our mentor base and uh, William Balbean had been a mentor for years at that time. I had never met him until I, I probably spoke to him over the phone once or twice, but I, I met him uh, at a um, sort of a startup evaluation event and he wasn't working 
it was at China Accelerator, he came by and he critiqued a bunch of the teams that were presenting. Um, and um, it was there that I could see that he was the right guy to, to take the mantle forward for China Accelerator. Um, so uh, we, of course, had a, a multi-year experience. We'd done some co-investments together. Right. He'd invested in a couple of China Accelerator companies over the years. Right. And, and then, um, so that, that was, um, you know, sort of the, the way that we knew um, that it was going to work out is because he was giving great advice to startups. Okay. Well, he once told me that you were as crazy as he is. Um, yeah, oh, I, I've just been told to raise my voice just a little bit. So I'm going to stand a little closer to the mic. Can you hear me oh, okay? okay? No, so William once told me that you're as crazy as he is. Um, yes, he is crazy in a different way, but I probably crazy or in other ways. So like, you know, the going to Iraq, you know, uh, yeah. being a helicopter pilot, doing crazy things like that. But, you know, he has his own level of crazy. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's here too. Co-founder Jumpstart International, an NGO in Iraq for two years, almost two years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, I went in, I didn't go in uh, to, run a, to run a humanitarian organization. I went in as a filmmaker and I was invited in by the Iraq, you know, by the regime, Saddam regime uh, wow. at the end of their uh at the end of their thing just before just before the war kicked off and so i got into iraq and then uh i was in baghdad when the shock and awe campaign was happening in in 2003 and then so i was sort of i was working for cnn and reuters i you know my i was doing freelance work and so I'd give my footage over to Christiana Anampour and she'd put the, you know, she'd put the, the words over top of the footage and things like that. And I'd give it to other different people. You know, there's loads of people that use the footage. Um, and then I would uh, just as a, I went in just sort of as a freelance uh, photographer, basically, and just getting out there in the, in the stuff. Um, and so that was an interesting time. Uh, and, you know, the then after about you know four months or so of that i just was like hey this is like i was upset a little because i was i'm an american citizen as well as an irish citizen and mostly born in america lived in america so i was upset with the level of progress that, that was being made to put iraq you know onto a firmer footing you know to yeah. be self-governed and everything and it was just moving really slowly. And I just thought that I could step in and help out. So I formed um, Jumpstart International. And we, we employed around, you know, we started with just one sort of project uh, in Iraq, you know, just trying to get their electricity back online, um, working with engineering uh, groups and, uh, well, working with engineers that worked for us um, at the organization that I hired to bring on. And we would just clean out uh, and uh, get ready for reconstruction and then do some reconstruction of the National Library, the National Museum, the, the various universities, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of you know, Hospitals, wow. all sorts of things. So we wow. employed about 3,500 people. We were the largest humanitarian organization in Iraq after the uh, UN pulled out. Wow, so uh, this is quite a stretch from venture capital. Uh, and I do want to get into some of your, how you run SOSB and how the cohorts work and how the accelerators sure. work and what kind of technology you invest in. And I'm sure our audience wants to know all about that. So maybe you can uh, first start off by saying um, how much you invest every year and um, what are the leading sectors that you invest in and- Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so-, so an overview. We, you know, so we call ourselves the Accelerator VC. We invest uh, in about 150 new startups a year across um, the various different categories that, um, that we uh, invest in, which is hardware. We're the world's most active investor in hardware, which is basically, you know, robotics companies, um, uh, startups uh, that do Internet of Things, uh, sensor devices, all kinds of different um, um, hardware devices. 
Um, and we also are the world's most active investor in life science startups. Um, so right. everything, as I mentioned, from the future of food, like cellular agriculture, uh, to um, new therapeutics. We have a number of therapeutics and diagnostics against COVID, for example, um, and uh, you know, new types of uh, you know, um, uh, ways for uh, carbon sequestration, all sorts of life, but using biology as a technology to advance uh, quality of life on, on Earth. So we, um, we are not an impact investor uh, exactly, probably 80% of what we do is impact investing, but we also do uh, some other areas like uh, in, in China Accelerator, for example, we do a lot of e-commerce and, um, okay. you know, we, uh, with, uh, you may, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, BitMEX, which is our, 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 a FinTech play that has done extraordinarily well. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we do um, a variety of, uh, of different types of investing in China. Um, we run hacks in Shenzhen and in Xi'an and um, in Yeah, I, I've been to hacks, which was really great because you had all those prototyping facilities. There are a whole floor where you could make things. And yeah. then upstairs was the, uh, all, the, all the little engineers, inventors, entrepreneurs doing stuff. And yeah. then you had this yeah, we, whole pitching session too. I saw, I got to see the pitching. And then the yeah. other interesting thing uh, was that uh, you were right next to, uh, what do they call that? The supply alley uh, in Shenzhen um, where I, all those, no, all those it, little maker bots are. It's, uh, it's called Wachong Bay. And Wachong Bay is where all of the, uh, you know, electronics uh, companies, uh, you know, show their wares um, for components and, uh, and, assembled uh, parts and accessories right. and things like that. So, um, yeah, so we're right in the middle of Wachang Bay. Uh, I think you were in our last facility. We've since expanded yeah. out of that. That was on two floors on, on top of the markets on yeah. right there, the, the, the head of the markets. We've moved yeah. into another building, which is even bigger. It's actually all on one floor, 70,000 square feet. We can have about 300 entrepreneurs that are working out of the space. Um, and we have a tremendous amount of uh, facilities for, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for rapid prototyping and for, um, you know, we have all of our uh, engineering staff. So anyone who comes and gets, we generally give like to hacks companies, we'll give them about a quarter of a million dollars. We're the first yeah. investor that's yeah. in, in most cases uh, into these companies, the first professional investor, yeah. and we'll give them you know, they'll, ha they'll come in with say a prototype and they're experts in whatever their field is, but they'll come in and then we'll, uh, we have industrial designers and design for manufacturing uh, folks, uh, you know, and uh, electrical engineers and, and uh, all different types of mechanical engineers and whatnot that will help them uh, take their, um, their prototypes and bring it to ma manufacturing quality and get their bomb, their bill of materials, the cost of materials of uh, manufacturing down so that they yeah. can compete uh, more effectively. Um, yeah, and I wherever they manufacture some, it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing some robotics companies there and I guess some of those have been yeah. calling to work on disinfecting plants and stuff like that in China now. Right? That's right. Yeah. Actually we have one of our COVID uh, related uh, robotics companies is one that just actually is being used in airports and hospitals in China. It goes around and it does UV disinfection, UV disinfection uh, yeah. in spaces uh, and blasts, uh, blast the, the areas when they're not occupied uh, to sterilize the, the, the areas, as well as that same robot also has a temperature set, sensing. So as people are walking by it, 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 can, it identifies the people and what their, what their um, temperatures are, and then it can let them uh, know that they are above uh, the, the, you know, where they should be, you know, for, and they should report to uh, check in on their health uh, status. How does it let you know? Does it send out a message to you or it just a little? Uh, it's all, all these, you? you know, all these computers are all connected these days. So yeah, it, like the, it, there's a, if you go to um, the website uh, for, uh, let me just, uh, UIBot, um, yeah, UIBot, you can, yeah, if you go to UIBot, you can see the video and you can see how it's recognizing the faces of people, and then it's also saying what their temperatures are as they're as they're walking uh, by. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, so it's um, 
Yeah, it's, it, and that's something that would pro, that would work in any place, but it certainly works very well in China. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, China uh, doesn't have any worries about the privacy issues or anything sure, like that. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so what? Are, yeah, absolutely. What, so, what are some of your other companies that have been called into action to fight the? It related to COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we have a number of companies that are. Uh, scaling up on uh, diagnostics, uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, rapid, uh, you know, new reagents and whatnot that that have five times the throughput of normal, uh, um, uh, you know, like CDC tests. Um, so we have a company Renegade Bio that's based in uh, San Francisco and New York that's doing tests for a huge number of organizations and and um, first line responders. Um, and uh, and that sort of is just a couple of months old company, but they're already in the millions in revenue. Um, the we have other companies like Casper Biotech, which is the first um, diagnostic using CRISPR Cas9 or Cas CRISPR CRISPR Cas12. It's using uh -huh. uh, normally people think of that as an editing technology, but you can actually actually also use it for quickly spotting um, and um, uh, diagnosing. Uh, you know any type of different sort of, uh, you know, uh, condition like, like a virus or other types of uh, conditions. So that is uh, extraordinarily affordable and that is an extremely important piece to it. It's a device that's kind of like a, uh, you know, it's about the size of a cigarette pack. If you remember what a cigarette pack is, nobody smokes cigarettes anymore, thank God. Um, and there's a, there's a little uh, micro cartridge that goes in. It's kind of like a pregnancy test and you put the, you uh, you know you spit into it uh, and then you put the micro cartridge in in the device and 45 minutes later you know whether or not you have uh, CRISPR uh, or cat you know you know whether you have COVID um, or not um, or whether you're pregnant. But not, yeah, it doesn't tell you whether you're pregnant. It probably could, probably could, uh, but you'd have to have a different strip for that. So it can you know depending on the strip that goes in, it can d diagnose any. Uh, number of different things. But what the cool thing is the, di the device, most of the ways that people do the diagnosis for COVID um, is using PCR uh, devices. They're the most accurate uh, way uh, to see if you have an active virus. Um, and, uh, the, um, and those devices are generally tens of thousands of dollars and they, they're, they require technicians to run and, and, and whatnot. So this is a device that's like a $200 device and the test strips are only a couple of bucks, like $10 or less. Oh. So you can actually have it be used, say, at a workplace or at an airport or at, you know, and, and you know, it can be tested five times a week if you want to, because it's so cheap uh, relative to uh, the inefficiencies of other ways of testing. So that is scaling up. That is... Um, that is going into manufacturing uh, soon and should be available uh, for you know when people really come back to work in force, um, which should probably be several months from now. We also have other companies, Antibody Therapeutics, uh, which can give you three month immunity to uh, COVID. Um, that is um, that's or it looks to you know we have to validate that that's the case. Um, but um, those are the types of uh, some of the types of things we also have an antibody. Um, antiviral. So there's, there's, there's actually like at least 10 different ways that you can defeat the coronavirus. Um, and we have, you know, shots on goal in pretty much all 10 different ways, <laughs> you okay. know, uh, or maybe not all 10 different ways, but probably seven of the 10 uh, right. different ways you, you could defeat uh, COVID-19. So where are these companies coming from? Are these from the China cohort or the uh, U.S.? They're from exactly. all over the world. From so all, like all Casp Casper, which I mentioned, uh, actually two of our companies were featured in the New York Times earlier this month. Um, mm -hmm. And Casper is originally from Argentina. Um, and, uh, and the other one uh, is um, actually, where is she from? Um, let me see. Uh, well, well, they're based in San Francisco. Uh, okay. Prelis uh, Biologics is the company. I'm not yeah. sure... I'm not sure where, where she was. I'm not sure. I think she was maybe San Diego. I shouldn't say. So, uh, but uh, the these are companies that have gotten millions in funding now to to scale up their their right. methods, and um, are uh, are really some of the most notable companies in the world tackling this problem. Right. So, 
it must be hard to keep track of all that's going on in your mini empire there. But I have yeah. to say that your assistant is fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Lindy's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have 36 companies that are, you know, battling COVID in various ways. Laboratory automation, you know, to do more testing uh, more quickly. Companies like Opentrons. Stratos, which is a device that attaches to your body to measure the, your pulmonary, your, the function of your lung, you know, and, and so if you're in the hospital, you know, for this condition or, you know, we want, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Rebecca, but we have a partner a, a general partner at uh, SOSV, one of uh, one of the one of our you know senior uh, staff that got COVID. Uh, did I mention that to you? Oh, no, yeah. no. So, oh yes, you did. Yeah. Yes. Oh yes, yes. In 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 the in your hometown there. Well, not right? in Princeton. He he's oh, he's in, in uh, he's in Connecticut. But, oh, he's in Connecticut. Um, yeah. yeah. So Brad Higgins, and so yeah. he got it. And he, he, his household is his, his wife himself and his, his mother-in-law. And uh, his mother-in-law, unfortunately, also got it. She, she died. And he yeah. and his, his wife was, was just asymptomatic. So uh, yeah. she, had, she had it. Uh, she has it still, actually. And she's still shedding even like, you know, many weeks later. This is like yeah. far more uh, sh shedding going on with this kind of virus than any other virus that I'm aware of. Uh, it stays around for a really long time, um, but uh, and he he uh, had to go into the hospital and uh, into the ICU, and he wow. um, he survived, uh, but uh, he is re recovering. And so I think there for most of the people are just talking about the number of dead or the number of people that have it, but they don't talk so much about the lifelong disability of those that ha had it and uh, suffer for from the disease for the rest of their lives potentially. And about a third of the people that go into the ICU actually end up with permanent mental disability, uh, it appears. Um, so that's, fortunately, I, my, my, uh, our partner, Brad, uh, was not affected uh, on a mental capacity, but he has a hard time walking. Um, he can't walk for more than 100 feet or so before he has to stop. So we're climbing. He's out of the hospital he can, now? He, he's, he's out of the hospital. He's been out of the hospital for about a month, yeah. And still in recovery. So, yeah, he's, he's going to have a long recovery. Wow. So I think actually most of us, I, I know, I, you know, through this whole series I've been doing, almost every venture capitalist that I've had on the series has had, you know, someone, a partner or a family member who's, who's had it. And I, I bet you most of the people here on the call know people who've had it as well. So, you know, it's just... Uh, well, I, I don't know, because if there are people from California, it's like, or from China, basically those places haven't had their first wave yet, other than Wuhan had a, had a wave, you know, um, and not much of one uh, compared to like uh, New York and New Jersey uh, or yeah. Spain, uh, you know. Uh, so like, like the first wave, when it comes, like LA seems like it may be starting to have a, its first wave, you know, mm -hmm. and San Francisco hasn't had a wave yet. You know, not so really. like, no, I mean, it's not at all. Like what we, we've had the wave of economic shutdowns. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, like a quarter of a percent of New York City is already dead. Right. And that's with only 16 percent of the population actually getting it. 16 or 18 percent of the population actually getting the, the disease. So you have to figure that the mortality rate, assuming you've got a hospital system that's completely fully functional and working, you know, is about a 1.5% uh, uh, infection fatality rate. And just to put that in, in perspective, like if you've got like the average person, like not these days with Facebook and everything else, the average person before social media knew like 150 friends. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a fatality rate of one and a half percent, that's basically a little over between two and three people that, uh, that you would be in, in your circle of friends that would die, uh, you know, from it. Um, and if, if you just let it wash over, you know. So I think the, the key here and the thing that we're fighting to do is make sure we've got good antivirals, we've got good antibody therapeutics, so that when it does wash over all of us, you know, uh, you know there's a, maybe there's a vaccine uh, that may take years. Uh, but even if, even if it does wash all over all, all of us, if there's a good antiviral, 
who cares? Because you won't die anymore and you probably also won't end up with a lifelong disability. So that's the challenge is to get and wait to the point where, uh, where we can let it wash over us, wait, uh, not wait, work like hell to either isolate it, like China's done a good job, tracking and tracing, testing, tracking and tracing. Sure. South Korea's done a good job. Um, New York is starting to do a good job. Um, and, uh, and, then, um, and then, you know, and then at that point, uh, you have a chance uh, to let it infect everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, if, you've, if you've got some precautions in place. Um, so I hope that we can, uh, uh, you know, because everyone will eventually get it. So there's, uh, so that's just, you just have to accept that. It's so, 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 it's so, the, the R naught is so high. And the, and the period of time that, it, that an infected person, the virality is so high. And the period of time that an infected person keeps shedding it is so long. Mm. It's not like a normal virus. Mm. So anyway, we'll see. Wow, so are you, um because of all this, are you changing any of your investing strategy? You might do maybe more in biomedical area, or how how are you changing your investing? Strategy? Yeah, we 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 have always uh, yeah we you know we've allocated to around I'd say we'll invest twenty million or so into COVID nineteen related uh, startups. Um, we're always at early stage. I, I didn't probably describe most of our investment strategy. So we our typical check is two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the mm-hmm. sort of the accelerator period and then we'll follow on into companies after that but our 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 highest checks are generally about a million and a half or two million dollars and that would be on a round of ten million dollars um so we're we're in as the solo investor only at the accelerator stage and then we only invest in the companies that come through our accelerators so if they've been someplace else if they're not going through our accelerators then we're actually not going to invest we have such a we have 8,000 applications a year to get into our accelerators, so we have enough to look at. How many, um, how many applications a year? 8,000, 8, maybe 8, more now. Yeah, that was last year, so oh, it keeps growing. Wow. And they, yeah. they, they get in for six months, right? And then they get mentoring and they get well, space. It depends on which it depends on which program. So this year basically, um, you know, we're we're lengthening the programs because of the coronavirus. Right. Uh, and uh, because it's not an ideal situ- situation for those that are relying on wet labs or hardware manufacturing facilities. So as a result, um, we are um, you know, we're spending more time with uh, the companies to make sure that they get extra special, you know, attention in this time where funding from angel investors, I'm assuming is going to be plummeting. Um, and actually, in terms of angel investors, it has been plummeting. In terms of professional investors, there's been, there's been a lot of uh, activity, it's sort of record activity. Uh, but I, I don't, I, I, I think that's, I, I don't understand why that is. Uh, honestly, because normally it's it's it, like you would in a condition like this, you would expect uh, people to be slowing down and putting their hands in their pockets. Angel investors have been putting their hands in their pockets. They're they're <clears throat> keeping the reserves. <laughs> they're keeping the reserves for a rainy day. <laughs> yeah, but we 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 do about a deal a day uh, in terms wow. of the number. Uh, you know, we do. And that's not just the companies that are going through the accelerator the first time, but it's follow on investments to the companies after they graduate. I see. So it's interesting that they first have to be in your in one of your accelerators before you invest. That's step right. one is getting into one of your accelerators. Step two is do all of you all of those who get into the accelerator, you invest in all of those? We invest. Yeah. I mean, generally, well, I mean, the traditional investments are about a, 250 for hardware and life sciences and maybe a hundred to 130 to 150 for food and, and, um, and uh, China accelerator and Mox, um, those, those software companies and things like that will uh, don't require quite as much capital or okay. as much resources. So what, what's the trick to getting into getting acceptance in one of these accelerators or trick? Or um, what's, the, what's the, well, I mean, how do you thing, get into one of them? I mean, there's two questions is what, what, what's a normal trick and what, what's the time that we're looking at right now? You know, right. what is, you know, what's different about uh, COVID? Right. Um, I'd say, uh, 
normally, I mean, it's just having a very, very large uh, opportunity because we do go for, you know, really deep tech um, investments. Because they're so deep tech, generally, it takes several years for these companies to really, um, right. you know, to really blow up in a, in a good way. Um, and so we're in it for a long, uh, the long haul. And when you're in it for the long haul, you need to have really good returns. So that means you're looking for, you know, billion dollar marketplaces in the cases of life sciences, or at least sort of several hundred million dollar marketplaces in the terms of har uh, hardware companies. Um, in, in the software companies, you can afford to uh, be a little more diverse because the, the startup costs are, are less and they can, um, they can uh, manage with less capital. Um, so we would look for companies that have at least a hundred million dollar uh, sort of market uh, potential, um, and 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 a good and a good um, really good team. Uh, you know, so they need a solid team, solid tra you know traction is always a plus. They don't need to have traction, mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the stage we're coming in, um, but um, the um, but the other other thing is just a really great uh, technology uh, team. Like the, the team has to include at least one, uh, if not more than one uh, engineer that is really running the product and then one market facing type of person. Uh, right. And that market based facing person is generally a technical person, but it doesn't need to be. I see. So out of all these companies you've invested in and, and accelerated, uh, can you name it's one? It's a of thousand, them? actually. Last, last, uh, just last week, wow. we uh, invested in our thousandth company. One thousand, uh, and uh, okay. What was your most successful? Uh, well, uh, the ones that are most successful are not necessarily ones you would necessarily know. Uh, like, uh, but I'll tell you a, a couple that sort of are, are the unicorn Stand level uh, uh, companies. So if, if you ever heard of uh, Guitar Hero or Rock Band, yes. uh, so Harmonix. Guitar Hero, it's got such a weird yeah, name, that, you gotta remember it. Yeah, so that company was Harmonix that in, invented that. I, that was a very long time ago, but uh, it, was, um, it was one of the uh, you know, big uh, successes of its day. It was the number one video game in the world for a couple of years in a row in the 2008, you know, seven and eight period or something like that. And, um, and so that was a, yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, there was a, you know, uh, it was over a billion in revenue for those couple of years back when a billion dollars in revenue was actually yeah. a big thing for a, sure. a software company, uh, sure. a gaming company. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, so that was uh, one you'd hear of. We've got like today we've got companies like Memphis Meats, in, you know, which is the leading cellular agriculture company for yeah. meat. Um, they just raised $164 million by all the, you know, Richard Branson and Bill Gates and Cargill and Tyson's Foods, you know, that whole, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, crew. We have a bunch of other companies in that space. Perfect Day, which makes milk without cows. They also raised about $140 million about three or four months ago on a half billion dollar valuation. Um, so there's a couple of, of companies in the, in the future of food area that are, are famous now. Um, there's uh, companies like Form Labs, uh, which is a, a very leading 3D printer company that actually mm -hmm. prints using special materials. So it would be the number one uh, dentist, uh, you know, when dentists do cavity, you know, fill, fill ins for the cavity, they're using a Form Labs uh, thing to get the crown or do whatever they do to, to put that in. That, that's, the, that's the 3D printer that they're using because it can print uh, ceramic and it can print all this other. Uh, you know, highly detailed, extremely detailed um, work. Um, you know, uh, there's just, uh, let's see, well, BitMEX is uh, probably the world's fastest uh, growing, most profitable uh, startup, uh, you know, for several years anyway. Uh, they have done extraordinarily well. Uh, you know, they're one of the first uh, companies, well, they're the only company I've ever invested in, we've ever invested in, where, uh, you know, they got to, you know, 30, 50 million in uh, profits uh, every month, um, which is where, which is where they, where they are now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just shockingly, uh, you know, shockingly uh, successful company. And that's, it's only a five-year-old company. So there's very few companies in the world actually that are as, 
profitable as, as that. NASDAQ is around as profitable as BitMEX. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's, you know, it's similar, uh, you know, it's, it's a much bigger, well-known company. Or remind uh, me what they do. BitMEX? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. They, they, they are a, a futures trader for Bitcoin. So oh. they, uh, and they, uh, you know, they're either the number one or the number two most active uh, trader of Bitcoin in the world every day. So if you look at, if you look at, uh, you know, the various ranking systems. There's another one uh, called Binance, which is, you know, sort of giving it a run for its money now. Uh, but uh, but for for the last couple of years, they, they've been number one before Binance is sort of up there as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's see if we have any questions here. Um, and get your questions ready for Sean here. And I know I do see a question here from Hal Kalman. He's asking about the robotics um, area that you're investing in. And I know you have a lot of robotics companies. Yeah. Yeah, so do you think, um, you, you mentioned that Nolan Bushnell had three failed robotics companies and it was a really yeah, tough it's, it's area. A hard, so. it, it is a hard area. We, we're, we're seeing that like the, the, the more uh, focused you are on the customer uh, rather than the general purpose robotics. We have several su successful general purpose robotics companies. Uh, and, and, and it depends what you call a robotics company, right? So we've got like make block, which makes these children's toys, which are drones and they, they, they draw, you know, the, the, they're, they're programmable, uh, you know, uh, products there's there's a wide range of ro robotics that they make that's that's a pretty cool uh application area really stem stem tools right and that's a a company that's maybe you know in the 100 million revenue uh uh, uh you know category um so it's a uh a type of robotics company it's not failing it's doing very well um uh, avid bots which is uh i don't know if you travel in uh, the world's airports more, more and more the world's airports are coming and buying like Singapore uh, was the first airport uh, that uh, used the avid bots robots to autonomously clean the the you know how there's normally a a, a person a janitor who's pushing along a machine to to wipe and buff the floors and do all of the cleaning of the of the of those great big malls and those great big airports, those great big marble services and all that. So they, they are, uh, Avid Bots is uh, doing those with autonomous robots, which do that. Even, even when people are walking around, they won't, it'll sl slow down or stop as they're approaching and then it'll keep going when, when people pass. Uh, but uh, you know, those, those, those uh, applications, the more applied it is to, um, a specific need, uh, the easier it is for the company to um, to really hit you know hit a market uh, that really w wants to buy ro robotics either as a service or robotics um, just as a solution. So uh, you know we've got robots that climb the wind you know skyscrapers and clean all the windows of the, the those glass windows of skyscrapers and do that all autonomously. So it's it's uh, trying to take the dangerous and dirty work that uh, that is um, not uh, very appealing uh, for humans to do and trying to make uh, that um, more um, something uh, that right. robots can take off the, right. off the plate. So uh, those, are do those are companies doing tens of millions in revenues. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, successful robotics companies now. It's just that they're not the general purpose robot that will bring you your... your uh, your martini, um, uh, the, the way that maybe uh, Nolan Bushnell was maybe thinking about it uh, in the day. Let's see. So who, who is your hero? Do you have a hero? Oh, I have loads of heroes. Um, uh, Tom you know. Sennison? <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, like uh, he would, he would, he would be, uh, yeah, he would be a, a bit of a hero. He's probably a hard, hard character. I actually have a lot of respect for uh, what uh, Steve Jobs did in, in, in terms of recreating, reinventing new in, uh, so many new industries. I mean, what he did just, thankfully, what he did for the telephone industry was unbelievable, right? Uh -huh. I mean, there were so many attempts before that tried to, um, tried to have a computer connected to the phone 
with applications on it, but the telephone networks wouldn't put it out until Steve Jobs came along with the iPhone and, uh, and you know, the Palm Pilots, all these other things. The, the telephone companies really had a lock on, on trying to get revenue out of every application that was running on, on a phone, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, up until the iPhone, we were all locked into that uh, thing. And the same thing oh, yeah. holds true for, for iTunes as well. You know, that, that was, a, that was a, a game changer to make it legal for people to pay for music um, and that really changed the, uh, changed the game as well. And, you know, it was, he's a real hero. So um, that said, I, I don't know how great he was as a human being. I, I met a couple of presidents of Apple, but I never met him, um, you know, and in the day. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, I've heard a lot of stories, but I have a lot of respect for what he did. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, you know, I find there's some remarkable teachers uh, in the world, you know, the Buddha, Jesus, there's a lot of people that have a lot of philosophy that I uh, hold up as heroic uh, and really revolutionary philosophies that, uh, I, that I really admire. And I'd like to see the world uh, do more in that direction. Um, and so th those, are, those are some heroes that I, that I would have. Those are wonderful heroes. Are there, uh, any areas that you feel that the world needs to solve right now? What do, you, what do you feel is the biggest area that we need to solve right now outside of the virus situation? Outside what, of the virus what is, situation? What is the big problem? And are you surprised that there are not startups that are tackling it yet? Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I believe in technology as a great equalizer, you know, God willing. Um, you know, it, 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 uh, it has given us a huge, huge, huge uh, level of access to information and, and capabilities. And when you think about how much money you save just by using your phone instead of having a, a stereo and, all, and a flashlight and, a, and a, you know, whatever else you used to have, a camera, you know, all those other, you know, all those things, all built into one uh, device. And fairly affordable, um, you know, all of those things, uh, you know, make for a great equalizer. And the fact that it's connected to the world's information and that's all in many countries almost free in terms of the access uh, costs for, for that, that's, that's a spectacular thing. So I think, you know, uh, I'd love it. What I have a problem with is that um, uh, there's not as much equality in the world in terms of the disparity in income uh, levels. And so a lot of it's flowing to, uh, you know, to create a lot of in inequality. And I'd love to see, uh, a, figure out a way to address those issues. And robotics, uh, you know, don't necessarily uh, solve that problem either. So we're in a bit of conundrum. Um, uh, obviously, you know, all technological aids have made our lives better, whether it's a dishwasher <laughs> or a washing machine, all the things we take for granted. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I do believe that we, uh, we have a lot uh, to, to answer for in terms of how we have designed society to, in the United States, not take a better care of the, the people who are our neighbors and our brothers and sisters. So like the healthcare system is uh, a disaster. It's a disaster in yeah. the United States uh, in terms of its, the inequalities and the, in, I mean, even, even the, the frustrations of just, you know, I have a, a decent insurance program and I find myself always having to pay out of pocket for everything anyway, right? Um, because, oh, that, that uh, I have a son with autism and that particular drug, oh, you have to use the generic, which doesn't work. You know, you have to use a brand name uh, thing, which actually does work versus the generic. So you end up paying hundreds of dollars a month out of pocket for, uh, you know, for the brand name. Uh, and other people can't afford that. That's completely unacceptable. You know, it's completely unacceptable to have on top of the, the difficulties of having special needs children to have to uh, not be able to take care of them. It's awful. Right. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of society ills, and they seem to be more exposed now than ever before in this era that we're all involved in. Uh, so well, We have um, a question from Matt. Matt yeah, I know. Matt, 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 Matt is going to get to that. He's going to pin you 
uh, to and ask you about your accelerator model. And um, I, that I would was, say it is a, a challenging. Model. It is a challenging time right now for accelerators because I think that the, one of the core values of an accelerator is the fact that you have a community of people that are uh, you know inter, you know like in most good accelerators you have them all co-located they're all learning from each other they're all building off of each other they're all mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of uh um you know mentors that can come in and teach uh to many people at the same time there's a lot of growth in a very short period of time in an accelerator and um in a in a in a competitive accelerator and um and so like uh you know our accelerators uh are you know, typically, you know, more like four or five months long and hacks is more like a year long program, honestly, because it takes mm -hmm. that long for the manufacturing uh, process and, and to, uh, to, uh, to get, you know, the, the devices through um, the factories and whatnot. So, um, so, uh, you know, with the length of the time that it takes, it's still an incredibly compressed, incredibly compressed period of time, uh, whereby companies can leverage, in the case of our deep tech accelerators, they're leveraging millions of dollars of infrastructure and teams. Like, it depends on what accelerator you're talking about. Like some accelerators are basically like one, you know, one gal or guy that are, is the, the managing director and an assistant mm -hmm. trying to help make introductions and, and improve your pitch deck. Um, and SOSV's accelerators where running deep tech accelerators with, uh, re, we've spent millions and millions of dollars, you know, $5 million building out wet labs and in, in San Francisco, or, you know, we're building a, a, a $12 million facility in New York. Um, and that those resources are available to all the startups to leverage uh, and to grow uh, from. So those, that allows them to not have to raise uh, in order to get going and to get their experiments done and to get their uh, de risk their companies de risk. It allows them to actually very quickly, um, you know, de risk their companies without having to raise the two million dollars it would cost to normally do the experiments mm -hmm. and and to set up a lab and and to have all the inflexibility around that um, and the time that it takes uh, to do that. So th that's what we're what we do with our deep tech accelerators in particular is give them the resources, you know, like a hardware company doesn't necessarily have the right skills. Maybe they have the programming skills to do the AI sensing, you know, thing with the, the cameras and whatnot, but they may not know the mechanical uh, best way to do the type of manufacturing they need to do injection molding or whatever, whatever different type of uh, processes to actually make the thing uh, work. So we have a team of 25 people in Shenzhen that extend the three or four person startup in a hardware uh, team with the people who will help them. Hey, here's a, here's a power su supply design that you should use, or here's a, you know, mm -hmm. this is a, these are the three chips that you should use instead of the ones you're using in order to make, you know, make the thing work better. So yes. like all of those things, save millions of dollars to the startups. So like if you have a, a deeply focused accelerator, you know, really vertically focused, you're getting a lot more than a pitch deck and an introduction to, to, uh, to, uh, to funders. Um, uh, so, but th that's, that's what, and, and, and the question I think uh, says, um, it's hard to show deep value to the entrepreneurs and it's hard to get also get good returns. Actually, you can do both if you're doing that kind of, if you're shortening the runway and if you're, you know, you're de-risking your company for the next investor. Like in, in Indie Bio, for example, the companies come in with just the normal sort of couple million dollar valuation that a startup would assume that they're worth. Um, and then they, and we only give them a quarter of a million dollars at first, but the average company or 70% of the companies are raising uh, two and a half million dollars at a uh, at a nine million dollar pre money valuation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just six months later, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as they graduate the program, so that's a lot of uh, you know a lot of things done in a very short period of time. And the the reason why it works is because we've de risked it on so many levels. Plus, there's a network of people that are out there that know that everything that's going through Indie Bio. You know, there's been a, you know, they've they've had to compete against 600 other people to get in the cohort, right? And so they're they know it's been de de risked in terms of some of those those issues. So I think that answers most of the questions. Yeah, and then that. some of your your 
some of your investors in your fund, aren't they corporations who might actually yeah. want to yeah, no, so, so we have Yeah, so we have lots of, uh, we have, uh, you know, we have normal LPs, high, high net worth individuals yeah. and uh, family foundations and, you know, universities. Uh, yeah, but you have government investors? No, we don't. No, uh, okay. As LPs, uh, yeah. no. Well, okay. actually, in a, yeah, we have yeah we have government related uh, government related, uh, but they're not major. Um, uh, the things that are driving the boat are people who are financial investors. They're just looking to make you know a good uh, return, but also some of them are also looking to do good in the world. Um, and uh, so you know, the, our our average sort of profile is sort of in the mid thirties sort of net IRR to, to, to return to the, um, to the, um, the, the investors, to the LPs. So that's really good. It's in the top couple percent of all VCs globally. Mm -hmm. So we can get good returns. Um, and, uh, and the way we do it is by delivering unbelievable value to the startups and having them be super successful. Um, returns with a high failure rate of startups, it seems that most accelerators are investing early to get, you know, uh, options via the follow-on investments. YC went the route of having a huge, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, man. It's fucking nuts. Um, they have like 300 companies in each cohort and, yeah. you know, they go to a, a banquet hall and they see, you know, at the far end of the banquet hall, Mark Andreessen gives a talk, you know, it's just like, it's right. not, it's, it's not the same thing when you have a cohort of 10 other companies sure. and you're sitting shoulder to shoulder for you know six months and going out and hanging out together and learning from each other those are relationships that will last you the rest of your life i actually modeled it somewhat after my film school experience when i oh, went to really? film school uh -huh. yeah and and you rely so much on your other people at right. film school and you know right. somebody's gonna somebody's gonna be a dp on this shoot some so you'll be a director and there'll be a uh, you know, other people will do the editing and whatnot, and then you'll switch roles in the next shoot. I mean, it's just a great, great cohort of people that I'm still friends with, you know, uh, decades later after I went to USC film school. Uh, but, uh, but and, and that is, you know, one of the reasons why we modeled this size of the cohort to uh, like a 40, 50 person uh, group of people, because there's so many relationships and so many skills in that 40, 50 people that you will and, and it's a small enough group of people that you can really get to know them really mm -hmm. well. That community is a huge part of what SOSB accelerators are about. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why we don't have the failure rates that other accelerators uh, have. Um, we have, uh, I think we have around a 20% of the companies that have been through an SOSB accelerator um, uh, are, are, have failed. It's nothing. Our model says that we could have 60% of the companies fail completely. Um, and, uh, you know, basically 80% of the companies could fail and we still have a very successful fund. We only, we've so far, I mean, we expect that 60% will eventually fail uh, or sell out or something, but uh, we've had a, a quite a, you know, as William Balbean calls them cockroaches, they will survive no matter what. And they are resourceful, uh, you know, to, to, to the ends of the earth. And, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a point to just stay alive just to stay alive. I think the, the challenge is uh, to stay alive uh, and do something meaningful and be a service to your customers, you know. Sure. Do we have government investors is another question. That yeah, we, uh, we, we answered that. So I, I think we're, oh, yeah. we're actually getting toward the tail end here. And it's interesting that you brought up that your film experience influenced the way that you've structured uh, SOSV, and I was going to ask you, what, you, given your diversified background, how that impacted your thinking about this. So you answered that. So uh, I think we yeah. need to move on now. And um, I'm going to bring my screen back up here and uh, move us on uh, to our networking and toast and also to our check your email for your login where we do our Hollywood squares, you know, everybody's face is on there. And so we've actually actually went over a little bit in timing on this. So we'll, and we got to so many great questions already, but we'll see how the, um, we're supposed to end at 7 p.m. Pacific time. So do please check your login for that next little meeting. And uh, let's give uh, thanks to Invest Hong Kong for 
their gracious support. Uh, thank you. And I know that they're on the line here as well. Lawrence uh, here in San Francisco, Robin and Carrie, all three of them here in the Bay Area. And I'd also like to uh, promote our next show, uh, which was going to be uh, next Thursday at 5 p.m. And our VC is Kyle Liu, who is at DCM. So please uh, tune in for that. And uh, thank everyone for joining us here today. And let's give Sean a round of applause. Thank you, Sean. It was great. I learned a lot. And, thank you, um, Rebecca. Yeah, and I'm doing the toast, and uh, Sean's going to drink his tea, and I'm going to have a sip of red wine. So, and I, all the rest of you out there, uh, please join us. So, what is this? We go to a our yes. email now, and yes, we... go to your email and check your login. Uh, and do for... I have to do that too? Yeah. Yes, you do too. Okay. Um, I, know. You're, and... I, I know Lindy emailed it to you, so you have that. Okay. 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 So I'll, I'll see you there in a minute. And everyone okay. else in a minute too. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you again. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.